grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. For some, what our lessons teach this morning is a great comfort. For others, you might regret being here. I've lived with these end time lessons now about every waking moment for the last two weeks. The only escape that I've had from them is sleep. You'll live with them for the next 15 minutes. So let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. The, the task that I have before you during these last couple of weeks of the church year is to focus your attention on a fundamental doctrine of Christianity. It is a doctrine that we've already confessed in the Nicene Creed, and it's confessed as well with the two other ecumenical creeds. And even though most are complacent about it, fading from one's thoughts before even pulling out of the parking lot, the apostles and the early church they were fervent in their expectation of the end of all things. They knew, just like you do, that this sinful world will not last forever. God brought the earth forth out of water, as St. Peter mentions in our epistle lesson. And St. Peter also declares that he will bring it to an end through fire after which the new heavens and the new earth are created. Now what we believe is that God's Word started it all in motion. It's creatio originalis, the original creation. God brought it all by the power of His performative Word. He brought it all into being. But God, he, he, His Word actually keeps things in motion. It's called creatio continua. And that he cont it continues, God's Word continues to sustain it and keep it in motion. And of course, God's Word is what's going to bring it all to an end. God's Word will bring it to a close, but before the heavens pass away with a roar and the heavenly bodies dissolve, before the earth and all its works go up in smoke, Christ will gather all of the living and the dead to make a final and eternal separation. This separation is between the saved and the damned. Between those who believe and those who scoff. Between those who are His children and those who are His enemies. No one will escape this. And nothing will change it. This day was set in stone before the foundations of the world were even laid. Staggers the mind, really. But Jesus is returning to judge every man, every woman, and every child. Everyone who has ever lived, doing so with an unswerving judgment. But, He wants to save you. In fact, He already has. Permit me to go back, all the way back to the garden where Adam and Eve, along with the devil, are gathered around a tree. A tree whose fruit, of that one tree, they could eat of anything else they wanted. But of that one tree, there was a fruit on that tree that was off limits. Eating from any of the trees of the garden, including the tree of life, was no problem. As I say, bon appetit! But eating from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, don't go there. Don't even think about it. Now remember, at this point, the pinnacle of God's creation, that being man and woman, Adam and Eve, they are made in the image of God. Amagio Dei, the image of God. This means that Adam and Eve are the way that they are supposed to be. They are rightly related to each other. They are rightly related to God. 
and they are rightly related to the rest of all creation. If we were to be in their presence before the fall into sin for just a mere moment, we would immediately break the commandment to not covet because we would want to be exactly like them. We would crave what they have. Because being made in the Imagio Dei, Adam and Eve, they are in sync with everything. And the statement they live by is, eat of this tree, the tree that they're standing before, and you shall surely die. But as you know, the devil offers them another statement, an alternative to what they've previously known. You will die? He says, for if you eat of the fruit of the tree, you will be like God. This blows me away because they already were like God. They're in the Imagio Dei. They are in the image of God. Yet the devil holds something out a little bit more for them. It sounds so free. It sounds so liberating. So what if it comes from the devil? He seems authoritative enough. And it's at that moment that everything hangs in the balance. Statement A from God stands directly opposed to statement B made from the devil. Who makes the better offer? Which one is more reasonable? Will Adam and Eve listen to God sticking to the tree of life? And the Imagio Dei, heeding statement A, but will they grab the alternative presented to them and go the devil's course? You know, stepping back for just a moment, this is completely inconceivable. Adam and Eve had everything, yet they are tempted to cast aside all that God has given them. We can't really make any sense of this because the why is not given to us. Yet what they do in believing statement B and going with what the devil has presented them affects them and everybody else since, including you. They rebel. They thumb their nose at God, taking the path diametrically opposed to God, pursuing, pursuing instead what they want, desiring to be their own God. God, of course, foresaw this rebellion. Thus, even before the world was made, God included the end, the very end. It's known as the telos, the end of all things. He included that in his plans, and everything moves to that end. Mankind would be doomed unless someone intervened, and that someone is the agnus dei, the Lamb of God. We'll sing about the Lamb of God in just a few moments. The Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Whose mission was to restore what was lost, to restore mankind to the Imagio Dei, to the image of God, to rescue all, not simply from trials, not simply from hardships here on earth, but to rescue all from the place prepared actually for the devil and his angels. See, hell is where the devil and his angels go, not humanity. And the Agnus Dei, Christ Jesus our Lord, would do this work of redemption, even in our pathetic, horrible, and unpardonable rebellion. So how did he do it? <laughs> Certainly not as anybody would expect. The Agnus Dei came in meekness around whispers of scandal. His mom was a virgin. Right. Whispers of scandal surrounded him. He's born in obscurity. He's placed in a lowly manger, growing up to eat and drink with sinners, and eventually betrayed and delivered up to sinful, plotting, false priests. He was condemned to death as a criminal on a cross. Harmless, really. Nothing to fear. But of course, in doing so, the God-man suffered the death and the condemnation rebellious sinners earned for themselves. 
and thus having made atonement for the entire world, paying the wages of sin by his own death, the Lord Jesus Christ, risen and alive in his body as a man, ascends to the Father. And ever since then, we have been living in the last days. The Bible says we have been living in the last days ever since Jesus ascended into heaven. Not knowing when he will come again in glory, but knowing that he certainly will do so. It's interesting when you read the letters of St. Paul, the earlier letters, as opposed to the latter letters, he is talking about the return of Christ, the return of Christ, the return of Christ. Well, then as he ages, he's realizing, ah, maybe it's not going to happen in my life, lifetime. And that's where you get the verses that say, I have, run the, I have run the course. I have finished the faith. Right? He's realizing, I'm probably not going to see it in my lifetime. But no doubt, he believed it to be true, that Christ would surely do so. So during this time between Christ's ascension and Christ's return, the nations have only known Christ in His meekness. Which is, to, which is why he's so easy to mock. So simple to scoff. So funny to ridicule and so common to dismiss altogether. But this, beloved, is not weakness. This is mercy. For he comes to us in this way that we might receive him without being destroyed. He comes to us now in meekness by word and sacrament. Again, not in a way that anybody would expect, but He's beckoning you, He's wooing you to repentance and faith, that you might listen to Him and His messengers, that you might be washed in the holy waters of baptism. Which, by the way, is how the Imagio Dei is brought directly to you. That you might be absolved of your sin, fed at this holy altar, and live in love and forgiveness towards the neighbor. We live in this time of invitation. And why is that? Why must He operate like this for so long? Because, beloved, He does not want any goats. Not a one. He wants nothing but sheep, with everyone gathered on His right, including you, leaving the only ones frustrated to be the devil and his angels. That's what he wants. But he won't get it, will he? No. It won't just be sheep at the last judgment, will it? No. There will be plenty of goats they will be placed upon or on his left. They will be judged and they will be cast into a place that was never prepared for them. But why? Because he said through the lips of his pastors, believe in the Lord Jesus. And they said, I'd rather not. He said through the lips of his pastors, be Christ beloved. And they said, I'm good. He said through the lips of his pastors, take and eat. And they said, I'm full. Or they said, it's just bread. It's just wine. No big deal. Maybe later. He said through the lips of his pastors, baptize your children and teach them the Christian faith. And they said, hey kids, there's a game on. He said through the lips of his pastors, there is coming a day of judgment. And they said, you know what? I'll take my chances. When that day arrives, the goats will protest. They will proudly stand by the works that they have done, thinking that they have done enough to get into heaven. But there is no And rejecting Christ's gospel of mercy and with no faith to be found, all they can do is be judged by the strictness of the law. The goats then say, but that's not fair. I used to love it when my kids would say that to me. 
was like, that was like sermon time 101. Let me tell you, kids, ain't nothing fair. They heard it from me so many times. It's exactly what the goats say. It's not fair. Trying to blame or cast it at gate Christ for having the audacity to judge them. But this is entirely fair. Because get this. He gives them what they want. They want a life apart from Him. And He gives it to them. It's horrible. Have you ever heard anybody say something to the effect of, hell is a place where God is absent? That's what hell is. Hell is a place where God is absent. If I was a lost man or an atheist, I would say, sign me up. God, you can't escape God. Hell is a place where God is, but not in His mercy, not in His love, not in His compassion. Only His wrath. You want to go there? Please. This is entirely fair. He gives them exactly what they want. He sees what's hidden to us and He gives them exactly what they want. Again, sin robbed mankind of Amagio Dei. And the Agnus Dei, the Lamb of God, restores it. And through holy baptism, delivers it directly to you. And since grace has now been given, one lives now in mercy towards others. Because Jesus really does care about that. But the goats... They care nothing of grace given nor of mercy lived towards others, nothing but themselves. So when it comes to this day, this day of reckoning, Christ, as I said, gives them what they want. It's completely inconceivable for these goats on the left to have to cast aside all that God has promised, done, and provided for them. But for the sheep, he gives you exactly what you want to. And thus you will not look upon this day with trepidation because His angels will gather you up and set you on His right where He does not condemn you. Friend, this judge, that's your Savior. The same Savior who comes to you every Sunday blotting out all of your transgressions, remembering your sins no more. In fact, this very morning, He bids you to come to His altar to give you His body that was nailed to the cross, His blood that was poured out from all of His wounds, saying, this is done for you. Take and eat for the forgiveness of your sins. And on that day, you will hear, this is the kingdom that has been prepared for you. In the holy name of Jesus, Amen. Now may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, guard your hearts and your minds through Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. We stand together.